Hello. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the impact of William III's wars and the development of the financial revolution after the Glorious Revolution. This is part of Edexcel, Britain, 1625 to 1701. Topic five, um, historical interpretations of the Glorious Revolution. And the way to think about that topic really is there's kind of three strands to it. So there's the constitutional settlement, which you talk about the Bill of Rights, you know, the Triennial Act, the Act of Settlement, things like that. There's the Religious Settlement, which is mainly the Toleration Act of 1689. And there's the Financial Settlement, which is what I'm going to talk about now. So there's three strands of the settlements following the Glorious Revolution. They're all interlinked, those three strands, so constitutional, religious, and financial. And they all affect the balance of power between the monarch and parliament. Okay? So in this video, when I'm talking about the financial settlement, and this idea of, you know, the extent to which there's a financial revolution, I'm going to talk through these different areas. So the causes of the, the financial settlement, the restructuring of government finance, the scrutiny of public spending, the Bank of England. Then I'm going to summarize things with three questions and then look at a couple of interpretations. I have done another video on interpretations, questions, and how to structure the answer. So I'm not going to do that in this question. I'm just going to use these to kind of illustrate the points that I'm talking about. Okay. So to begin with, the causes of, you know, the, the financial restructuring and new financial settlement following the Glorious Revolution is the Nine Years' War. Um, and the Nine Years' War is basically between England and Holland against France. Okay. So William III is the head of state England and Holland against Louis the 14th of France. Some historians have argued that Louis, sorry, that William the third took the throne in the glorious revolution because primarily because he wanted to use the, the power of the English Navy against Louis the 14th, his kind of great enemy. Okay. So it, this is kind of really central to William's, uh, you know, who William is and why he's taking the throne and, and his um, his real drive at this time is 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 against Louis XIV. So the war obviously has an impact on trade. Um, and it also really for us, what we are talking about is, is the financial impact of this. So I'm not going to read through all these things on the screen, but you can you can look at that. Um, Costs lots of money. And by the end of the war, both sides are bankrupt. It ends in this treaty in 1697 ending the war. So basically what you need to know is this war between uh, William III and Louis XIV costs lots of money. Okay. And because of that, because it's costing lots of, lots of money, it led to the government restructuring finances and spending. Okay. That's, so that's the real, the beginnings of this. So in terms of restructuring government finances, what kind of things are happening? Well, the first thing is the debt. So there's 5.4 million pounds a year um, expenditure at this time, but tax revenue is only 3.6 million. So this means that debt is increasing. William does have sources of income, excise duties on tea, tobacco, and alcohol. And there's a land tax introduced in 1692, which is new and which raises 1 million pounds in its first year. So that's pretty successful. And the crown also takes out loans from merchants. These are, you know, the land tax is new, but the other things there aren't new, okay? So excise duties, loans from merchants, you should remember that from, from the earlier Stuart monarchs. And they're reasonably successful. Royal income doubles after 1688. Um, and despite this, the national debt by 1698 stands at 16.7 million with very high interest. So it's, it's going to get worse. Um, so, so at this period, you know, this is a real central concern for government. How are we going to pay for the war? How are we going to pay off the debt? One way they do this and one way of dealing with these problems is the Civil List Act of 1697. And this is a really significant um piece of legislation because it gives the monarch 700,000 pounds per year, um, which the way to think about this is that this is resolving that long-term 
issue of the monarch's financial stability, which if you think back to Charles I, Charles II, both of those monarchs have had significant issues over finance and, and going to parliament and asking for money and then that causing kind of political problems for them. This resolves that. It, the parliament are basically saying, that's it, you've got £700,000 per year, that's it. You know, you're not going to mop up other, other sources of income like the other Stuart monarchs did. So it kind of resolves that. And the way to think about this, I think, is that following the Glorious Revolution, a lot of those long-term issues are resolved. Those, those kind of threads, those loose threads are tied up. So constitutional issues, like I mentioned before, are, are resol resolved or attempted to be resolved. Religious issues are resolved. Um, financial issues are somewhat resolved. I mean, the extent to which these things are resolved, obviously, is, is an interpretation. But basically, what you can see this, this period as, 168 to 1701, is a period of the resolution, the resolving of these long-term issues in constitution, religion, and finance. So the Civil List Act really kind of resolves that long-term issue that we've seen earlier on. Okay, then we go on to the public scrutiny of government spending. And what happens is in 1690, so sorry, just take a step back for a second, because of this increased spending, there's, there's a need to scrutinize what's going on. So to make sure that money is being spent in an efficient way. And in 1690, the Public Accounts Act is passed <clears throat> to do this. So it sets up public accounts commissions, of which the first one is in 1691. As it says here, they scrutinize public spending, publish reports to check on how government is spending money, to check on corruption and things like that. Um, and these are forerunners to modern day select committees. So this is a really kind of unprecedented change from the past where corruption was kind of rife. And it isn't the, obviously it's not the end of government corruption, you know, that <clears throat> that goes on, um, you know, and if, if you know anything about 18th century politics, you know, there's, there's a lot of that going on, but um, it really is unprecedented. And it's a move towards a much more modern form of government. As I said, the forerunner of modern day select committees and MPs, both Whig and Tory, would work together to expose deficiencies in spending. OK, so it's a real kind of modern idea. It is unprecedented a move towards more modern forms of government. However, so the counterpoint here is that by the late 1690s, these commissions had lost their initial power and have become a kind of political weapon. So they would use that, you know, MPs on these on these uh, commissions would use them to target their opponent, their political opponents. And so it kind of lost this initial this initial power. Um, but it is still it's it's pretty significant. And as I said, it's another example of the government resolving or attempting to resolve these these long term issues. Um, Next up, we'll talk about the Bank of England. So the Bank of England is established in 1694 by Charles Montague, who's a Whig MP. And um, the Bank of England is, what you need to know for this, for this topic, is that it's basically just an example of a long-term or, or a way of the government getting long-term loans. So investors would receive bills of exchange, and then there'd be a promise that they would then receive money from customs duties. So it kind of really stabilizes the system of government borrowing. Um, and if you think of a modern day example, think about short term loans versus long term loans today. So if you go to a payday loan company, you might be able to get the money very quickly, but the rate of interest is very, very, very high. So that's obviously really problematic if you don't pay the money back straight away. Whereas long term loans, you might not be able to get money as quickly but the interest rate is going to be lower. So it's much more of a stable option. However, this is in, this is introduced in 1694, Williams still did rely on short-term loans. So it doesn't kind of resolve things straight away. And I'll come back to this in a second, but it does stabilize things. It, it leads to greater trust and confidence in the economy. 
Okay. Another thing that does that to some extent is the Recoinage Act of 1696, which combats coin clipping. And I've got a picture there on the on the right of some clippings from coins. So what would happen is people would shave off the edge of coins, um, which was a really really serious crime at the time, um, and then and can, you know melt them down and, and make make a new coin. Or obviously, that those shavings would have value. Um, but the problem with that is then lots of coins were you know, were, were smaller than they should be. So people lost confidence and lost trust. You know, people in markets and things wouldn't accept the coins. Um, and it just meant that the whole system, there wasn't much kind of trust and confidence in the system. So the Recoinage Act is to combat that, you know, like modern day new banknotes that are that are difficult to forge. You know, it's an example of that. So again, we can see this is a resolution of a of, a, of an issue. Um, the Recoinage Act obviously doesn't stop um, people clipping coins completely, um, and it doesn't stop forgery, but it is just an example of the government addressing these issues to try and stabilize the economy. So that's what I would say about this, you know, this whole uh, th thread that I'm talking about in this video about the financial revolution is that it's about stabilizing the economy. And it has a, it, you know, that's a pretty significant jump from what we've seen before. As I said before, Charles the First, you know, seizing the royal mint, or Charles the Second with the stop of the exchequer in 1672, where there's just those things completely undermine any trust and confidence in the economy and in the, the kind of banking systems that are there. This stabilizes things. It leads to more trust and confidence, and therefore more investment, so the economy can grow. Okay, um, so now here's three kind of summary questions. And what I think you could do if you're revising this is, is pause this video and just write down some answers or just think to yourself, what, what might the answers to these questions be? So if you want to just pause it now and have a go at these and see what, see what you get. Okay, so I'll start going through them. So number one, what were the causes of the financial revolution? So the causes are obviously... Uh, the, the main, you know, most significant cause is the Nine Years' War. So William needs money to fund the war, and therefore he relies on Parliament um, for, you know, to to raise that money. And then Parliament find ways of raising money, scrutinising spending, and kind of stabilising the economy. Um, we'll come back to this in a second, but Parliament basically use that reliance on them to for their own interests to promote their own interests. Question two, to accent, was there a financial revolution? Well, I think it goes back to what I was just saying about stabilizing the economy. It stabilizes the existing issues. The previous, the previous monarchs had, had really um, undermined trust and confidence in the economy. And these, these, the Civil List Act, the Public Accounts Act, the establishment of the Bank of England, the Recoinage Act, these things bring confidence and stability to the uh, to the economy. Marxist historians have argued that, that this really isn't hugely significant in the sense of it being more democratic or anything like that. What, what they see this as is that it's just one elite taking power from another. So instead of the, 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 the monarch having control of finances, it's now the kind of nobility or the merchant class um, who, are, who are gaining political and financial control of the country. Um, so that could be a kind of counterpoint that actually it's not it's not real drastic, uh, not a real drastic change. It's just the power balance is shifting in uh, you know from one elite to another. Um, question three: How did financial changes impact the relationship between the monarch and parliament? As I said just now, finance is now in the hands of parliament. The monarch increasingly reliant on parliament, which we'll see in the interpretation in a second. And Parliament used William's need for money for the war as leverage to promote their own interests. OK, um, so in terms of kind of just before we look at these interpretations, key kind of themes to take away is, you know, increased um, scrutiny um, and accountability, increased stability and confidence. And then I would say a shift in the balance of power, the, the financial uh, impact of, of the Nine Years' War really does lead to a shift in the power balance um, between the monarch and parliament. 
Um, interestingly, this is a little aside, you wouldn't necessarily talk about this in, in an exam, but you know, some historians have recently argued that the financial uh, stability brought about as a result of this financial settlement is what stopped Britain from having a, a revolution in the in the 18th century. The other, you know, if you think about France, a cause of the French Revolution was, um, you know, financial issues. Whereas because of this, because of this financial settlement after the Glorious Revolution, um, that's that's taken the the money away from the monarch. It's not the monarch; it's Parliament. So therefore, it is even though Britain was far from a democracy, it's more accountable. Um, than, than, for example, the situation in France, which is quite an interesting kind of take on this. And I think that's a really, you know, interesting idea to to explore, kind of bit of a counterfactual. Anyway, last but not least, um, now we're on to the, some interpretations. So this is the 2021 paper. And I don't have time to go through this. As I've said before, um, I've done a question, uh, sorry, I've done a video going through the structure for the interpretation section of paper one. Um, with with you know how to answer these questions, and at some point I probably will do a video where I go through a paper in lots of detail and, and kind of plan it out as a video. Um, so what I'm just going to do is, is just read the question and then just give you the, what these interpretations say. Just and then if you wanted to, you know, you could plan this out yourself. So the question is: In light of differing interpretations, how convincing do you find the view that it was the financial revolution of the 1690s rather than the glorious revolution of 88 to 89 that changed the relationship between the monarch and parliament? So was it the financial revolution rather than the glorious revolution that actually changed the relationship between the monarch and parliament? So in extract one, Smith is arguing that yes, it was the financial revolution. OK, this is the thing that really changes the balance of power. And if we look at line number 13, the second paragraph, 13, 14, 15, it, you know, I think it's really summarized well here. So Smith says the power of the purse became much greater than ever before. And Parliament made increasingly frequent and ferocious use, uh, use of it. So. I think that's really, really important that the power of the purse is now in the hands of parliament. It shifts the, the power balance. And again, with with topic five, with these interpretations questions, you can compare it back to the previous Stuart Marks. Compare that to Charles I. Compare that to um, Charles II. Um, so really, Smith is arguing it does change, you know, the... Um, the reliance on parliament for money does change things. Um, he talks earlier on about the, the Triennial Act of 1694. Um, so, you know, the 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 war meant that the monarch was reliant on parliament, okay? Morgan in extract two is a, more of a kind of traditional view of this, but I think the main reason for that is that it's focusing only on 88 and 89 here. And what... Um, Morgan is arguing is that you know the the Bill of Rights and the Glorious Revolution um, that was the thing that shifted the balance of power. And if you look at lines number um, 28, 29, and 30, it says fundamentally the Glorious Revolution can be seen as a historic turning point involving the decisive rejection of an entire form of government. Um, if you look at line 24 and 25, you know. The, the restored constitution was replaced with the, the, the will of the nation expressed through parliament. So this idea that 88 and 89 was the significant moment when the balance of power changed, whereas Smith, on the other hand, is saying, no, it was actually the balance of power was more affected by the finance, financial revolution. Obviously, it's up to you, you know, it, what your what your view is on this. But I would argue that... Um, you know, there are counterpoints, aren't there, to the Bill of Rights set, you know, and historians have argued that actually it's not as significant as it's been made out to be. Um, that, And I think it's hard to question the idea that the monarch, you know, now relied heavily on Parliament for finance, and that shifted the balance of power. Parliament used that as leverage. So I hope that's been useful. I know I've gone through quite a lot of things quite fast, but hopefully you've picked up the main points there. Um, all right. Thank you.